Um, but today's webinar uh, is a very exciting one. We've been uh, talking about doing this one for a while. Our presenter is Howard Carrier, who uh, completed an LL, LLB in honors at, and an LLM in the, in the Law of Human Rights and Civil Liberties at the University of Leicester. Thereafter, working as research associate at the Business School of the University of, the University of Nottingham for projects investigating litigation funding and access to justice. Subsequently, he taught constitutional administrative law as lecturer in law at the University of Sunderland before relocating to the United States in 2005. His past dozen years include, include the MSLS program at UNC Sil Chapel Hill Sills and subsequent appointments as reference librarian at Valdosta and his current post at, as copyright coordinator and social sciences librarian at James Madison University. So we're very excited to have Howard with us. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much to, to Linda for the generous uh, welcome and introduction. Um, I'm Howard Carrier, and as you heard, uh, the social sciences librarian and copyright coordinator here at James Madison University, which is located in Harrisonburg in the Shenandoah Valley. So a little bit about today's webinar. Um, first of all, uh, apologies on my part for the um, rescheduling of it. I originally intended to do it from home, and my cable company, who shall remain nameless, let me down. So uh, that's why I wasn't able to go ahead last month. Now, I'd rather hoped that that would actually be a fortunate thing, that there would be, you know, the UK election was pending, and we would have some certainty as to the direction of Brexit once this webinar was scheduled for after the UK election on June 8th. And that prediction as well seems to be entirely erroneous. So here we are in very uncertain circumstances uh, talking about Brexit. What I'm going to do um, is basically I have um, a guide which I will happily share with, with Linda at the end of the webinar so she can circulate it to participants if that would be helpful. Um, it's fairly rudimentary in Word. Um, I'll go ahead and find a more suitable uh, piece of architecture for it. And basically, this is what I'm going to work through today. Now, here's really why I'm so interested in this topic. Um, well, there are two reasons. First one, you know, naturally, I am living in America, but I am British. And um, I wouldn't say I saw Brexit coming out of nowhere. And I think one of the things that we'll talk about in the webinar today is the slow kind of snowballing um, that, you know, uh, cause Brexit to, to come to fruition. Um, but secondly, um, I think the, the thing that I would like to stress is that um, this is not a webinar about the technical aspects of Brexit. There's a wonderful resource which has already been circulated, um, produced by librarians in the United Kingdom, that addresses the legal and constitutional aspects of Brexit. And I'm sure many of you have seen it circulated at the GovDoc L listserv. It's the resource produced by the law librarians at the Middle Temple in London. This is much more a personal reflection on how Brexit um, came to be, the webinar today. And the reason I'm starting with a picture of European Union passports, and down there in the sort of bottom right-hand corner, um, a, a British one, is because it does strike a very personal chord. I was one of the first um, British citizens to also become an EU citizen. Um, in fact, I was discussing this with a friend who was visiting me from England last week, and we were sort of describing how Brexit had impacted upon us, uh, had impacted us um, to uh, an American student of political science who was interested. And I said, well, we were the first generation after the Maastricht Treaty. You know, I was a teenager in 1992. I got a British passport for the first time. Unlike previous British passports, it wasn't a blue citizen of the United Kingdom passport, it was a red UK citizen within the EC, as it then was the European Community passport. So it's been like an entrenched part, I think, of, of cultural and you know personal identity um, for you know British people under the age of 40. And all of a sudden we're now in this situation of Brexit. And secondly, um, when I was a young law student many years ago at the University of Leicester, one of the most progressive aspects about the Leicester Law Course was that um, it demanded a module in the law of the European Union, which at the time seemed wonderfully progressive. Um, I now look back at it and think, well, if we're just about to leave, then you know, there were three credit hours that I didn't have to do. 
do. But in fact, you know, that, that would be a flippant response. So how did you come to Brexit? This is the question that I want to address in today's webinar. How did this come about? So like I said, not a technical examination of Brexit, but the road to Brexit, charted through relevant sources and resources, which I will share with you. So um, I put the links into this document, and like I said, I'll share it with Linda, and I will cut and paste these into the browser as we go along and discuss them. So first of all, some very general um, resources. First of all, I think the, the one that's perhaps most useful in terms of a general understanding of European integration, it includes the primary and secondary sources. Obviously, one could go to Europa uh, um, or URLEX and actually get URLEX and get the actual treaties themselves. An excellent sort of resource for the primary and secondary sources dealing with European integration um, comes from the uh, Centre Virtuel de la Connaissance de l'Europe, um, hosted by the University of Luxembourg. And we will go ahead and look at that in just a moment. Um, if you want a guide to general, you know, a general description, a, a wonderful, actually, uh, book evaluating the long, strange relationship, um, the long, strange trip, if you like, between Britain and the European Union, uh, to borrow a bit of Jerry Garcia's verbiage, um, David Gowland produced this, recently published his excellent book, Britain and the European Union, um, published by Radledge. It charts, really, the long, tortuous relationship um, between the UK and the EU. And last but not least, um, I mentioned to you, for those of you who have a general interest in the technical, uh, legal, constitutional um, sides to Brexit, this LibGuide, or Guide to Brexit, produced by the Middle Temple, would be the best place to begin for that. And I, I don't propose to go into this in, in any detail, which is not my work. Um, it was produced by the librarians at the Middle Temple. But for those of you looking for the legal aspects of Brexit, legal opinions, um, the constitutionality of Brexit, or its impact on the, on the UK, on the constitutional terms, and the very technical questions related to Article 50 and matters of that type, um, this is the guide to use. It circulated a few weeks ago uh, on gov.l. I spent some time looking at it, and I can only express my gratitude to those librarians putting it together. It really is comprehensive and quite wonderful. The Middle Temple, by the way, is one of the inns of court um, in London. This is actually an amusing aside. The legal profession in the UK is split into two sectors. These the lower end and the higher end, if you like, the lower profession and the higher profession. Solicitors um, do the basic administrative work in law and have rights of audience in the lower courts. Barristers who have the right of access, rights of audience in the higher courts belong to certain legal societies of which the Middle Temple is one. Um, the others are Gray's Inn and Lincoln's Inn and the Inner Temple, I think. So it's one of the slightly arcane legal societies in the United Kingdom but still, of course, has you know, a significant law library, and that's where this has come from. So enough about that. Let's go ahead and begin our webinar properly. Really, what we're going to do is go through, um, I think, some key periods in the UK's membership or relationship with uh, the European Union. And we are beginning um, in the late 1960s, or the mid-1960s. Uh, the time at which the UK first began thinking about um, joining what was then the EEC, the European Economic Community. Rather basic this, and I'm certainly not going to go ahead and, and run this search um, you know, live, but I think the way in for primary sources is simply the search in the London Times. And I constructed a search there, which is quite useful. The first one covers uh, the date range from the 1st of January 1957 to the 1st of January 1974. Now, those dates are significant. Uh, the Treaty of Rome, um, if you like, the foundational treaty of the European Union, dates from 1957. Britain did not join the European Union at that time. Um, but the conversation about it starts to really develop um, in the British press um, from that date onwards. Uh, Britain did join the European Union in early 1973, so I ran the search through to 1974. And so basically that search will work fairly well in the London Times for finding all the articles that relate to Britain's original, if you like, initial contact or relationship with what was then the EEC. 
Um, refining it a little bit further, um, that would cover the date of the first referendum on the UK's membership of the EU, which we'll come to in just a moment. Then the last one, um, this one that includes the search terms de Gaulle or France or French. Um, as we're going to see in just a moment, one of the principal objectors to um, Britain joining the European Union was Charles de Gaulle. And I don't propose to provide a history lesson, that's not my province, um, in, in why uh, de Gaulle objected so strongly, but those are, you know, people who have an understanding of, of Gaullist nationalism um, probably have a fair idea why. Um, and so searching across that date range from 63 to 68, you will find both the veto in 1963 and the veto in 1967, in which the French sought to veto um, the UK joining uh, the European Union. So we'll go ahead and look at one of the, the sources I mentioned very early, early on, which is um, the CVCE. Um, my French, my schoolboy French is very bad, you know, Rue Le Gar. Um, so I'll, I shan't massacre its name again. Okay, well I shall. Centre Virtual de la Connaissance de Europe. Let's go ahead and take a look, and I'll show you why I think this is such a, a, a valuable resource in this early part, although it goes you know, all the way through. Um, UK's relationship with the EU. For those of you who haven't used this before, what it does is provide both secondary commentary and um, links to primary sources uh, regarding key historical moments um, in the European Union. And here we are dealing with um, the early part of um, European integration, and particularly uh, the UK and its applications for accession to the common market. So um, the one thing that I wanted to particularly pull up here, um, the first application, here we go, and it charged the negotiations between um, the UK and the five uh, sort of leading powers within the uh, EU at that time, or the EEC. And here is um, the reference to Charles de Gaulle's veto um, and an explanation of why uh, he wants to veto um, UK's membership. And I said those of you, you know, with an interest in, in the goal probably worked it out, you know, very quickly. And then the link to the key uh, core resources um, from the time that deal with, um, and here really are a, a mixture of uh, what quite wonderful collation of primary resources um, relating to the initial decision uh, by the UK to seek membership of the common market. And in terms of understanding, I think, sort of British attitudes to the EU at this time, there is a nice uh, cross-section of satirical cartoons which question its succession through to um, fairly early statements issued in the House of Commons and other um, core uh, documents going back to the Miller government in 1961 um, that discuss the first application. And similarly, of course, for the second application to the common market, um, this is the one that actually led to Britain's membership starting in 1973. Um, it basically uh, came on the basis of a campaign pledge in 1964 by uh, Howard Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister. Um, the French objected in, in 1967, but then de Gaulle leaves office and the opposition softens. And by 1973, the United Kingdom has joined the European Union, or what was then the European Economic Community. For those of you who are familiar with Hansard, I'm sure that's probably all of us, um, Hansard is the place to go, of course, for uh, you know, the, um, the parliamentary debate on this. Um, it's the archived version of Han ha um, Hansard that goes through uh, from 1805 through to the mid-20th century, or the late 20th century. Um, in searching within it, for those of you who haven't used um, the Millbank Systems version of it, it's a little bit unwieldy. I actually did a webinar on British legal sources back in for this early webinar series um, back in eighteen back in eighteen twelve back in twenty twelve, and it's quite interesting that uh, this archived version of Hansard has in no way improved its graphical user interface um, since that time. But basically, searching for the EEC within the relevant decades through to 1970, will find you what you're looking for. And in particular, look for um, either answers given in the Commons 
or speeches uh, by particularly Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister at the time, um, or the then leader of the opposition, Sir Edward Heath, who became Prime Minister um, in 1974. The funky but uh, fundamental primary source is Hansard. And here we see it dance towards the European economic community in Britain in the late 60s and early 1970s. So we come on to the next great step in Britain's membership of the EU, and it's just a referendum of the 5th of June 1975. My mistake, um, got a little bit mixed up there, sorry, with my Prime Ministers of the late 60s and early 1970s. Howard Wilson left office on the 18th of June 1970. There was the, the, an election in, 19, in 1970. The Wilson government um, was voted out of office. The Conservative government of Edward Heath was voted into office. And uh, Edward Heath then was Prime Minister in 1973, when the UK first joined the EU, or the EEC. And it should be important to stress that Edward Heath was actually a very uh, prominent and enthusiastic uh, pro-European. Wilson a little bit more reserved, as we'll come to in just a moment. Um, there's then a 1974 election, and Wilson, who was voted out in 1970, but still leads the Labour Party, is re-elected. And one of his core um, pledges was a referendum on EU membership. So one of the things that really, I suppose, runs through Britain's history, the history of Britain's membership of the EU, all the way from its first accession in the, in the 1970s through to Brexit, it's sad, really. It's kind of marred by inter-political party infighting, which really is one of the key things that, um, that leads to these, these referenda. Um, the left wing of the Labour Party, led prominently by uh, the famous Tony Benn, at that time um, was quite opposed to Britain's membership of the EU, and so, quite frankly, in order to placate, um, that side of his party, Wilson offered a referendum on EEC membership in 1975. There's one document here that's really quite important, and uh, I'll show you in a second, you know, again, it's rather obvious, but the search in the National Archives of uh, the UK, the Discovery Catalogue um, for the 1975 referendum. But one thing I found that's really quite telling is this document um, from 1975. It is it's a memorandum, uh, at the time quite confidential, written by the Lord President of the Council, that is the Lord President of the Privy Council. And in essence, having established that the referendum is going to take place, it starts to actually define or suggest um, the nature of the referendum. And here is written on an old mechanical typewriter or perhaps an IBM golf ball, um, the actual ballot paper that uh, actually was used in the 1975 referendum. What's really interesting about this document and why it has such a bearing on Brexit all these years later in 2016 is it specifies the terms of the referendum. Essentially, uh, collective cabinet responsibility was suspended, so cabinet ministers could campaign on whether or not uh, Britain should stay within the EU uh, without being bound by um, the system of collective cabinet responsibility, whereby the cabinet collectively gathers around the official policies um, of the government as enunciated by, by the prime minister and by definition the cabinet. So they had a free shot, really, at whether or not they could campaign to stay in or stay out. And secondly, there is the debate about whether or not this is a binding or non-binding referendum. And this is very important because uh, the Brexit campaign of 2016, in many ways, sought to bookend uh, the referendum of 1975. So really, the people of 1975 were given this very broad uh, remit for deciding whether or not they want to stay in the EU, and so were the people of 2016. So I think this really did inform, uh, all these years later, uh, the Brexit. Um, digging into uh, the National Archives um, discovery, the simplest way to search in this is to simply search for the documents for the 1975 referendum. 
this is searching across um, the National Archives in Kew. And quite interesting, again, trying to understand, this is fundamental to me, the attitudes towards the, the EEC at this time. It's really interesting, the, the documents that come up here. Um, I'm actually from Merseyside, uh, that's Liverpool, up in the northwest of England. And so hand-wringing by the luminaries of the Merseyside Communist Party in 1975 as to the advantages or disadvantages uh, of um, the uh, membership of the EEC. I'm going to come on to campaign posters and pamphlets in just a moment, but those are quite interesting. Um, but that search for the 1975 referendum across UK National Archives discover, Discovery um, is a very, way, very good way to you know, find uh, these core documents. Um, not all of them have been digitized. In fact, a lot of them haven't. Uh, and, well, I have opinions on the, you know, the prices with the UK National Archives, charges for digitization. Let's just say if you have any contacts in the London area that want to get on the tube and go to queue, if you need any of these, that might be the most um, expedient way of getting hold of them. So some uh, interesting things to look at. Um, this Commons briefing paper uh, of 1975, um, we will gloss over that for just a second because this was actually published in 2015. One of the things that informed um, the Brexit uh, debate and the Brexit referendum um, was in, you know, the 1974-1975 referendum. So here is a wonderful analysis of the earlier referendum um, published by the House of Commons Library. So I will correct that erroneous URL when I send the document to Linda. Um, because it really is, one of my criticisms of so many aspects of, of British government is its refusal or its reticence to look at what went before. Um, something which drove me particularly nuts during the um, foot and mouth uh, crisis of the early 2000s was the fact that there was a wonderful report um, written into the 1967 outbreak, which government ministers at the time had apparently failed to consult. You know, the distance between 1967 and 2001 is not really that substantial in human terms. So there you are, with my outraged government document librarian hat on. Um, I was appalled that uh, they didn't properly consult, or there was no evidence of them having properly consulted that document. Here, they did. Um, this is a briefing paper in which the uh, 1975 referendum is scrutinized in terms of its applicability to the 2016 Brexit referendum. So these are quite nice. Um, these are the 1975 referendum pamphlets. So there's various sources for them. The Bodleian um, has uh, a digital exhibition of them. Now this source here, Harvard Digital, I don't know quite what that is. Nobody can really uh, dig things deep enough to understand who has transcribed them. Someone individually has taken the, the time and effort to uh, transcribe many of the leading pamphlets from the 1975 referendum. From what I've seen, the ones I cross-referenced, they look to be accurate. But the, I think the best one is the LSE, the London School of Economics uh, digital collection of 1975 pamphlets. So those of you who are familiar with the, the wonderful BBC TV series, Life on Mars, in which someone goes back to the 1970s, we're about to enter 1975. These were the pamphlets that were used by um, the Yes and No campaigns 42 years ago. And again, when I framed this, this referendum, sorry, this webinar, I didn't frame the referendum. Just the one of the things I wanted, as I said, to understand was how did we, you know, what do people think? Why did we get this, this road to Brexit? So it's interesting to look at the attitudes of 42 years ago, because honestly, in so many ways, the attitudes expressed in 1975 are remarkably similar to the attitudes expressed in 2016. This one I find particularly in memory of Wales to be killed by the common market. Uh, the 1975 um, apathy for uh, the European Economic Community in Wales was apparently high, and that was expectedly um, replicated all those years later in 2016. And when I come out to the Brexit section um, in just a moment, so in a few minutes' time, I'll express why I find this attitude to be objectively um, so strange, so, so incomprehensible. The 1975 referendum, and I, I particularly love that, uh, that collection of 1975 pamphlets. And the thing I should stress, um, I didn't 
cross-link this to later on in the document, but I will. It also includes 2016 pamphlets as well. So that's still open. You, look at, you can compare 2016 to um, 1975. And like I said, um, for both, well, particularly for the out campaign, uh, the, the attitudes expressed and the way they're expressed um, are remarkably similar. Some of these are not terribly tasteful, uh, but they are important primary sources, which I think, you know, as we try and understand why Brexit happened, um, give us a pretty good clue. So I said there were various stages to address. We dealt with Britain joining the EEC in the early 1970s, late 60s, early 1970s. We dealt with the 1975 referendum, and now we come to the Maastricht Treaty of 1992. And this, I think, is the really important midpoint uh, in Britain's membership of the EEC, which turned into the EC, which post Maastricht turned into the EU. We are now really at crunch time, and I think that this really is where we start to see Brexit really, it, it goes back to this. The Maastricht Treaty of 1992, is fundamentally the integration of the European Union. It really focuses on three fundamental things, the free movement of goods, workers, and capital. So this is the, the true, if you like, creation of um, the, the EU at this time. And if you go ahead and actually look at your letters, that's how I pronounce it, E-U-R-L apostrophe lex, um, it's summation of uh, the Maastricht Treaty. This really is when all these previous elements of the EC start to come together. So we're moving away from different separated uh, constituent parts of the former EC European community and instead, as the name implies, moving towards um, a true European Union. And the three pillars of the EU European communities, common, common, a common form of security policy, and then it introduces the idea fundamentally of European citizenship, increases the powers of the European Parliament, and begins to originate the idea of EMU, Economic and Monetary Union. And the EEC becomes uh, the EC, and then by extension, as we see, becomes the EU. And this really is where the sudden crisis in British thinking about UK sovereignty starts to really become very, very prominent. And in essence, this really was a very fraught uh, time for the UK's membership of the EU. The Prime Minister at the time was John Major. And that's the other interesting thing. There are so many strange parallels that you know, lie in, in, in the history of Brexit. Um, we are currently in the situation whereby the current Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, first became Prime Minister because the previous Prime Minister, David Cameron, resigned. She was not elected um, in a general election. Initially, she was essentially elected by the Conservative Party to become leader of the Conservative Party, which under the UK's peculiar unwritten constitution, whereby the leader of the party with the biggest common majority automatically becomes Prime Minister, she became Prime Minister. The same was true of John Major. Mrs. Thatcher had been forced in government in 1990. There had been a Conservative leadership election, and John Major had become Prime Minister. And I think history actually is probably going to be kinder to John Major than it was at the time, um, because it was his unhappy loss in life to have to basically force the Maastricht Treaty, or you know, the ratification of the Maastricht Treaty uh, through the House of Commons, and subsequently through the legislative process in the UK, the House of Lords, in order for it to become law, so it could be ratified. So, so, so a, a, an actual piece of legislation could become law so that we could ratify the Maastricht Treaty. So some fundamental things when you're thinking about the Maastricht Treaty in this, this moment um, in the UK's relationship with the EU. First of all, when you search for it, adding in ERM, EMU, the exchange rate mechanism and European Monetary Union, these are core things. Um, Major was a very big fan of the exchange rate mechanism, which began in 1979, a system whereby the variable exchange rates would hopefully be somewhat more integrated so that European currencies were not competing aggressively against each other. The other aspect of this is the social charter or social chapter of the Maastricht Treaty. And this was fundamental. This was a real attempt, you know, the first attempt to actually extend um, social provisions 
uh, to European Union law, whether through regulations or directives, um, which would impact the lives of EU citizens living in their member states. So these are the sort of things that actually specify how much maternity leave somebody gets and things like that. At the time, there was the most enormous backlash against both of these ideas um, as the Maastricht Treaty was being debated um, in the House of Commons, particularly from Eurosceptics, as they were called in John Major's government. So again, this, this history that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, so much of this is influenced by political party infighting. Black Wednesday, um, the date in uh, September 92, is the um, date at which uh, the United Kingdom leaves the exchange rate mechanism. And so at that point, Sterling is then um, outside of the ERM, uh, and it becomes known as Black Wednesday because essentially there is no confidence, there's a lack of confidence that um, the power will not essentially be devalued. The major won't live up to his promises in terms of Sterling, and so we start to see this slide. Anyway, so when you research this, this, this part, um, this is really what we're dealing with. And here, um, again, this is uh, the key part of this, the, the opt-out clauses that the United Kingdom reached uh, in terms when it came to ratify the 1992 Maastricht Treaty. So two things were opted out of. First of all, this is the origins of Britain never actually joining the euro. Um, it opts out of the European Monetary Union. And at this time, it also opts out of the social charter, the social chapter, as it's sometimes called, those key social provisions, which I mentioned to you a moment ago, things like um, maternity leave and matters of that type. So other sources um, that perhaps will be helpful uh, when you're thinking about this particular period uh, in Britain's relationship with the um, EU. One I particularly like, uh, even though ostensibly it looks as though it may come with a level of political bias. Um, the articles by Dr. Martin Holmes, um, he is a professor at Mansfield College, Oxford. And the reason I say issues of potential political bias, they are circulated through the Bruges Group, which is an independent think tank, but most people regard as being right of center. But a, a truly um, wonderful analysis of um, John Major's efforts uh, to ratify um, the Maastricht Treaty and um, this, this period in the early 1990s in which this core question of where does Britain belong in the EU is really addressed both socially and politically. Um, you know, this, this question of are we just actually ceding um, too much uh, sovereignty to the European Union as the European Union moves from being fairly you know, just parts of, the, of, of one collective organization to being an actual union. The actual act which um, makes the master, which ratifies the uh, Maastricht Treaty is the European Communities Amendment Act of 1993. For those of you familiar with the UK um, statutory website, it's in uh, UK legislation. It is a public act, UK Public General Act, 1993. And somewhere in here, I think it was chapter 32, the European Communities Amendment Act 1993. So in 1993, the UK ratifies the uh, Maastricht Treaty, missing two core elements. It's missing uh, monetary union and it's missing the social charter. And so we move forward in history to the Tony Blair Gordon Brown government of 1997 to 2010. Here, I think there is a fundamental confusion, and I flag it up because if it's something that scholars, not scholars, but students, sorry, um, people perhaps early in scholarship, um, can become confused by in the United Kingdom, that's certainly true of other jurisdictions too, like the United States. And also, it was a huge problem, I think, for the general populace. So here we have a quote by uh, Joshua Rosenberg, QC. And Rosenberg is, he seems like he's been on television for, for decades, probably because he has. Um, QC, Queen's Council, a very well-respected barrister and a leading UK legal journalist. So writing in the Law Society Gazette 
uh, which is like the in-house magazine of the Law Society, Britain's equivalent, or sorry, England's equivalent to the ABA. He says, I have spent much of my career trying to persuade people that the European Convention on Human Rights has nothing to do with the EU. There are two European courts, I explained patiently, one in Strasbourg deciding human rights cases and one in Luxembourg dealing with EU law. This is really significant and I think it's one of the things that's got muddy and confused um, in the debate about Britain's place within the EU. In 1955, the Council of Europe was formed entirely separately, as you know, from um, the Cold and Steel uh, Commission, which goes on to become the EEC and then the EC and subsequently the EU. So essentially we have now in the 21st century two completely parallel um, intergovernmental organizations in Europe doing slightly different things, the EU and the Council of Europe. And the uh, European Convention on Human Rights belongs to the Council of Europe. It has nothing to do with the EU. It's our Bill of Rights. Um, belatedly, you know, many, many, many <laughs> years after the Americans had a go at creating a Bill of Rights. It only took us two horrible world wars and we thought we might have one too. And the European Convention on Human Rights provides that. We are dealing with fundamental human rights. The right to life, the right to freedom from torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. Uh, you know, the, the right to um, understand the charges brought against you. The right to have your case heard by a competent court. These are this is a Bill of Rights which has nothing to do um, with the European Union. But it got confused in people's minds. And the Blair government in the early 1990s, quite rightly in my judgment, introduced the Human Rights Act of 1998. What the Human Rights Act of 1998 does is it takes the provisions of that Bill of Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, and it says that UK domestic law has to be interpreted in such a way that it complies with the requirements of that convention. And this causes a massive furor. People who are concerned about uh, UK sovereignty are outraged. And the reason they're outraged is human rights cases often require very unappealing people um, to be protected in so many instances. And some of these people, there was a famous case, um, to give you an example, uh, two small boys had a tragic and horrible case, had uh, murdered um, a toddler in Liverpool. And in a rather political um, approach, the then Home Secretary had set the tariff how long they would serve in prison. They took their case to the European Court of Human Rights and it was subsequently shown that a politician ought not to be setting that tariff, it should be set by the judiciary. So, and there were other cases too, um, one relating to um, the assassination of IRA uh, operatives on Gibraltar in 1988, all of which the British Conservative press viewed very, you know, um, viewed in very unfriendly terms. And this got muddled with, I think, a general disdain um, for issues of intergovernmental uh, European institutions um, as it was seen meddling in UK domestic policy. So although this has absolutely nothing to do with the EU, it becomes a very unpopular thing in people's minds, or some people's minds, and this issue of Europe generally, you know, becomes, you know, I think a hot potato around this time, around the time that the Blair governments are introducing the Human Rights Act. Go forward another decade or so, and the Treaty for Establishing a Constitution for Europe is on the table. This subsequently becomes the Treaty of Lisbon. Here, the key, you know, constituent parts of the um, EU, notably um, the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament, are given essentially, it seems, on paper, greater powers. Um, they move from uh, a system of voting um, that requires uh, a unanimous decision and move instead to qualified majority voting. At the time of the Treaty of Lisbon, um, 
the two countries that are most concerned about this are Poland and predictably the United Kingdom. And the one thing the United Kingdom is incredibly worried about, again, is this issue of whether or not UK domestic law is subservient to EU law. And this becomes, you know, this is really the thing that runs through all of this, I think, this, this concern for, for sovereignty. And I think it comes, you know, it's just a, a very difficult um, or basic problem of understanding. These are treaty obligations, you know, we've signed up to the treaty, we've accepted that with this treaty we're now into this, this area of international law where, whilst not being um, superior to our courts, our, you know, um, citizens can take their cases based upon um, direct or horizontal effect to the European Court of Justice, so whether it, in terms of um, how EU law, whether it's a regulation or a directive, um, governs their relationship between them, the individual, and the state in which they live, or against other individuals in the state in which they live. It's, you know, it's examining the obligations that arise under the treaty obligations. It's not imposing a superior legal structure onto the United Kingdom, but that kind of gets lost in this discussion. So going back to sources rather than the history lesson, this is a wonderful thing, a wonderful source, a resource. Um, and I said a more complex understanding of the legal relationship between the EU and the member states would have helped. Perhaps if everyone had had a look at the uh, University of Portsmouth European Studies Hub in the lead up to Brexit, they may have had a more complex understanding. This is something I would encourage you to explore. So it really is a crash course in the EU. And the bit that's particularly interesting, I think, in question, in terms of this question of, of governance, um, where this confusion starts to creep in, what is the, the status of the European Court of Justice um, to me as a citizen of the United Kingdom, um, is dealt with very, very well um, in this resource. And I particularly like this bit here. We'll take a lighthearted look at some of the myths um, regarding EU governance. So wishing to understand concepts like direct effect, horizontal effect, um, the relationship between EU law in terms of the individual in the state and the individual and other individuals, um, the place of the ECJ, um, the fundamental uh, organizations for, you know, um, within the EU, uh, who does what, um, whether we're talking about the Commission, whether we're talking about the Council of Ministers, whether we're talking about the European Parliament, essentially the separation of powers within the EU, if you will, um, these are, you know, addressed very, very well at this hub. So if any people had gone here before they filled out their Brexit uh, votes, you know, maybe they would have voted differently. And so did Brexit. And this is why I'm so confused. And I do appreciate that, to an extent, in addressing it this way, I really wish to, you know, stress I, I'm approaching it objectively. Um, it's genuine confusion on my part. It's not advancing. Um, I readily confess my personal belief that the UK should stay within the European Union. Um, but I'm not advancing that cause. But to an extent, my confusion as to why it didn't is what has driven this webinar. If we look at the BBC's map, this um, is the post-Brexit map of uh, 24th of June 2016. It helps if you have a, a smattering of British geography. The lead share of the vote maps. So I suppose the first thing I did was go and look at my hometown of Liverpool and was reassured to see that Liverpool overwhelmingly, well not overwhelmingly, but substantially voted to remain. Where things become a little bit confusing, and this is why I say the, uh, the uncertainty of why this happened, if we go and look at Sunderland, where I used to work, Sunderland up here in the northeast, Sunderland voted overwhelmingly to leave. Why this is confusing and the stroboscopic effect of the BBC website is not helping this in any shape, manner or form, is the fact that the leading, one of the leading employers in Sunderland uh, is Nissan Cars. They don't make Nissan cars in Sunderland purely for the UK market. By definition, the factory is there to manufacture Nissans for continental Europe. 
So this is this is the confusion I felt um, in in the late June of 2016. You know, um, working in a factory in Sunderland making Nissan cars, um, which are able to be sold uh, in the European Union tariff free. One would have thought um, that Sunderland would have been an enthusiastic remain uh, constituency. In fact, it was not. So some standpoints that explain, um, I think, uh, people's position on this. First of all, UCLA has done a wonderful job of collating key websites um, from organizations with an interest in Brexit. So if we look at that very quickly, everything from actual think tanks through to political organizations, through to UKIP, um, again, in terms of objectivity, I am not going to comment on the actual pledges that were made by some of the uh, organizations um, wishing to leave the European Union. Um, those questions are already being addressed in the wider debate on Brexit in the British press. But this is a, a wonderful resource for um, accessing the, the archives of the archive websites of the organizations that have an awful lot to say about Brexit during the campaign. Similarly, um, the British Library has done something rather similar um, in terms of archiving these resources. So capturing and preserving the EU referendum debate, understanding what people were saying um, in 2016. And lastly, uh, a couple of things I think are two of the best sort of arguments that were raised one way or the other. And in terms of um, objectivity, uh, one of them is a very uh, eloquent argument for remaining by Nicholas Barr, Professor of Public Economics at LSE. Um, and this is actually a link that starts with a sort of generic um, discussion uh, at the LSE website um, linked to his uh, article and a link to the longer article itself. And really, um, in a way, far more eloquently, he has, he has questioned exactly what I was questioning um, in terms of the free movement of, of goods. Um, free movement of goods are far more important than, if you like, the free movement of services or the free availability of services. And he draws um, a comparison between free trade agreements and mostly about goods like cars, chemicals, rather than services such as insurance. So um, a really eloquent um, consideration for the argument to be made. And in, in the interests of um, political balance, or balance on this issue generally, um, probably the best argument I've seen, or the, you know, the, the most uh, well, best research, perhaps most uh, eloquent argument, it's quite okay to walk away, um, in which Michael Burridge, offering a very different uh, standpoint to Nicholas Barr, um, evaluates um, the virtues of, of Brexit. So, no, no, no reason to go to these, um, but they're there for your information. Where did Brexit come from? You need to look at the Conservative Party Manifesto for 2010. This is where David Cameron first stresses there's going to be a referendum, as he calls it, on the transfer of power from uh, the UK to the EU, as it's phrased. Again, I don't think that's a, a particularly accurate way of phrasing it, but that's how it was phrased in the manifesto. At that time, it's important to stress in 20, 2010, there isn't the fundamental statement of, we're going to have a, a referendum on EU membership straight in or out. That comes later uh, during the... Um, a coalition government between uh, the Conservatives led by David Cameron and the Liberal Democrats led by Nick Clegg between 2010 and 2015. By the time we get to the Conservative Manifesto for 2015, it's in there, it's quite straightforward, we are going to have a referendum. But here when we look at this, and I just can't resist showing you this because it, I think it, it just goes so closely to the heart of what's being talked about. Um, this is the Guardian's analysis of um, the 2015 manifesto and its implications for Europe. And here, under the European Union, 
they've mentioned scrap the Human Rights Act and introduce the British Bill of Rights. As I said ad nauseum earlier on, and many people have tried to you know, remind uh, you know, people in terms of Brexit, the Human Rights Act has nothing to do with the European Union. And yet when even you know, what you might call a newspaper of record, a broadsheet newspaper like The Guardian, is seeming to muddy these concepts, I think it's a, probably a fundamental part of why Brexit happened. And so, this is actually really quite nice. I know I'm down to three minutes. I will go through this really quickly. The BBC's timeline on Brexit. Um, essentially, what I try to cover very quickly, but nicely summarized into sort of bite-sized pieces, which if you want to show a student why did Brexit happen in, you know, basically one page of letter-sized paper, that would cover it rather well. In the remaining time I have, paths beyond Brexit. So here is um, a really important document which really sets out, I said I wasn't going to go too much into the legal aspects of this, but what's going to happen? This is the EU's uh, memo, if you like, on what happens when under Article 50 of the Treaty of Lisbon, um, a member state decides to leave the European Union. I find this graphic vaguely optimistic, you know, the rope is being pulled apart, but there's still perhaps some hope of splicing it back together. Here um, is, if you like, uh, an analysis of how Article 50 will operate. And so to the current situation. Um, on the 18th of April, um, British Prime Minister Theresa May called a snap UK general election for the 8th of June 2017. It was assumed that the nature of Brexit would dominate the campaign, hard or soft Brexit. I am not going to read the news to you or, or just show you the stuff from the BBC, but this question of the hard or soft Brexit is really what we're struggling to deal with. I should go ahead and perhaps, you know, if you're happy for researching this, um, look in more detail. The hard Brexit basically is the standpoint which was being used as the campaign approach by the May government in the lead up to the June election. Uh, and essentially, it's, you might see it as a complete withdrawal from the European Union, but with the assumption that we will be able to negotiate the most attractive parts of EU membership whilst getting rid of all the stuff we don't like. Um, or rather, when I say we, I mean the the advocates of this model. Um, quite how realistic it is to continue to belong to a club and you know uh, pick out the, the very best aspects of membership whilst just conveniently avoiding the parts that you don't want to deal with um, is questionable, but that was the campaign pitch. The Labour Party, it's a softer Brexit. They respect um, the Brexit referendum of 2016, um, but in a softer way that preserve the aspects that, you know, have become embedded in British society arising from the social chapter. Other um, questions that, you know, or, or approaches that are being rooted are when it's going to become a de facto sec, uh, sec, second referendum on Brexit, which is the Liberal Democrats' position. They say there will be a referendum, their position was, on the actual terms of Brexit, which would quite frankly, you know, this will be turned into a second referendum on Brexit itself. But the issue with all of this is that um, the election turned out to be not to be about Brexit at all. It turned out to be about social matters, the NHS, education, things like that. Brexit is just part of the problems pervading the United Kingdom at this time. In one of those very strange um, kind of parallels that seem to run through this story. I mean, those who are interested in Jungian coincidence will be fascinated by this. When John Major, all those years ago in 1993, was trying to get through um, the Maastricht Treaty or the legislation that would allow the ratification of the uh, Maastricht Treaty, he had essentially a very, very small minority, sorry, very small majority governments. Um, elderly British MPs kept dying. He ended up with what was a de facto minority government, and he had to call on the small political parties in Northern Ireland, notably the, the DUP and the Austin Unionists, to prop up his Conservative Party government uh, to survive a no-confidence motion and to go ahead and seek the legislation that would ratify the Maastricht Treaty. 
All these years later, Theresa May called an election which she thought would be a referendum on uh, the hard Brexit, if you will. Um, it was also, I think, probably motivated by the fact the leading opposition party, the Labour Party, was doing very, very badly in the polls at the time. Without wishing to uh, read the news to you, this is the last thing I will show you today, as you know, the UK election did not go according to plan. There's no overall majority, and in fact, Mrs May is now in the position of seeking a deal with the DUP, the Aussie Unionists, in Northern Ireland in order to prop up a conservative, like conservative minority government to once again deal with a fundamental question of the UK's membership of the European Union. It's hard to know what to say. At this point, um, we have stalled. Uh, today was supposed to be the day in which the, the nature of the deal between the Conservative Party and the Democratic Unionists would be announced. Tragically, there has been uh, an appalling accident in London, um, a, a terrible fire in uh, the block of flats. So that has been postponed whilst um, that's being you know, dealt with and seemed inappropriate to be overtly political, I suppose, while such things are going on. Um, the uh, European Union is expecting uh, the United Kingdom to begin uh, the Article 50 negotiations this week. Clearly that's not going to happen as we deal first and foremost with the problems in our own Parliament. So the paths beyond Brexit currently are, well, completely uncertain. I appreciate that webinar today was probably, um, like I said, it was not a technical exploration of Brexit. It was one slightly confused Englishman, having lived in America for the past 12 years, recognizing that something very pivotal had happened uh, to you know, his country's constitution uh, last year. And based on my own experiences as an EU citizen and as a UK citizen, trying to make some sense of it. I hope it's been of some interest to you, but I would be very happy to take any questions that anyone may have. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, thank you very much, Howard. This is great. There are a lot of things, I mean, the wonderful resources, um, definitely. And then, I mean, one of the questions I had, um, and I mean, I think you've covered a wide range of resources, but just in terms of keeping up with what's coming up, um, what's happening, what do you, you think would be the best resource for someone who's you know, relatively new to the issue who wants to, um, or especially if we have students who want to keep up with this, what would you recommend as being the number one resource to use for that? I mean, it's at the stage when the, the only source I can honestly think of, um, and, and I know it sounds like a cop out of the newspapers, um, this is moving so, it's not that it's moving quickly, it's not it's moving like treacle, um, but it's moving so uncertainly, you know, uh, we are now a year, in fact, when you and I first talked about this webinar, I said it's, it's a good time, you know, it, it's a year after Brexit. We knew it wasn't going to be an immediate um, uh, shift, but it's, it's essentially a year later we are no closer to resolving how this is going to play out. Um, and now with the increased complexity of a minority government in the United Kingdom, um, I think you're going to see a long period of stalemate. The, the attitudes towards Brexit and the other parties in the United Kingdom are, are massively different to those of the Conservative Party. Um, the Labour Party, for the most part, most of their members voted against Brexit, some did not. They respect the decision to, to leave, but they do not respect the idea that it's a fundamental separation from, from Europe, which honestly you know, goes far further, I think. In fact, the Europeans that I've spoken to, in fact, I think you see this in the European press, are genuinely distressed. You know, um, we, we have had uh, a, a bond, you know, not just politically, but culturally, that had lasted, as I said, I'm 40, it's been there all my life. And that's now gone as a rejection of both Europe and the European Union. I can't provide you with a, a, a source um, that, you know, the describe this properly until it all plays out. I think the students that, that really want to keep an eye on this, I would simply say, do your best to look at the European newspapers as well. Um, you know, some of them are available in translation, the better quality uh, German newspapers like developed and so on and so forth. If you can find them in translation or, or can read German. 
Um, and similarly, you know, the London Times, the Guardian, um, and the, the leading British papers of record. At the moment, uh, you know, I think during 2016 there were three, as everyone likes to say, um, three huge surprises. The first one was Brexit. Uh, the second one was the only one that was fun, which was Leicester City winning the Premiership, which would be like, I don't know, pick, pick, the, pick the, you know, most lackluster American football team and send them to the Super Bowl. And then the third one was in November, when the Americans had a little surprise for the world as well. And uh, I think we're in that situation. Um, I know this sounds like a very flippant comment, but here in the United States, how, how well can we predict um, what government's going to look like, you know, in, in a few weeks' time. Things are moving very, change, very quickly and very rapidly, and also with far less certainty, perhaps, than we're used to. And I think that's very true of the United Kingdom at the moment as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that's a good point in terms of the European newspapers, not just because my two students, they tend to focus on the BBC, but then don't actually go to the No, BBC. please, please, go, <laughs> go, and, go and find the EU yeah. sources too. Uh, do not rely purely on the British uh, attitude to this. Yeah. And actually, it's also interesting as well, you know, for people who are looking for um, English language, you know, go, go look in the Irish Times or something like that. Um, the Irish relationship with... European Union is very, very different to the British one. And also the whole question of Ireland now is just very thorny because one thing I didn't touch on in the webinar, but the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 created a soft border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. A hard Brexit puts that back and that will be unacceptable um, and all of us can reflect on peace in Northern Ireland being one of the most significant achievements in the last 20 years. Right. right, and and not quite as monumental, but even uh, with the data community and all of the, the cross-European initiatives they've had. No, absolutely. In terms, like you say, regulations and data, that's, that's a, a pivotal concern. And, you know, if we also look, and in fact, one of the, the things with the, um, the soft Brexit talks about is maintaining Erasmus, you know, and the educational links between the UK right. and the EU, um, principally, you know, British universities are terrified. <laughs> there's, there's an awful lot of EU funding that uh, will not necessarily be going their way. All right. Well, thank you very much again. This was wonderful. And I did get a, a, a comment from someone who came to it came to me privately saying this this was masterful. So um, thank you very much, Howard, for co covering this and. Very kind. Thank, thank, you, thank, thank you very much to everyone for, for tuning in today on, you know, for the fairly dry subject of the UK and the EU. I appreciate the audience.